I'm Edward October, and this is A Nefarious Nightmare. This podcast contains foul language and discussions of violence. Additional trigger warnings will be posted as needed in the show notes. Listener discretion is advised. The Action People, Dodge Magnum XE, 78. Detectives matched the Dodge Magnum with an ATM transaction, and Lisa picked Long out of a lineup. His reign of terror was finally over. If we had not captured him when we did, he would have, uh, I'd hate to think of what his body count would have been. Long later confessed to at least eight murders over that eight-month span in 1984 and was sentenced to death. A lot of lives just gone right down the tubes because of me. You know, in one way or another. And it's not a good feeling. It's not a pleasant feeling. I'm not proud of anything I've done. And the worst thing is I don't understand why. I don't understand why. But investigators and prosecutors believe he raped dozens of women before his killing spree, answering classified ads by unsuspecting young women. Oh, he's an absolute sicko. He's an arrogant, arrogant son of a bitch. He was an arrogant guy. He used to go, his big start was in rapes. Uh, he would answer ads where the uh, parents were trying to sell the baby furniture. So he would go to the house hoping to find the little girl or the young mommy there. For more than 30 years, Long sat on Florida's death row until new governor Ron DeSantis signed Long's death warrant last month. Today, we will be discussing one of the most cruel serial killers ever. One that mostly targeted sex workers and thought he can get away with it because he kept his eyes closed. Yeah, because if you don't see it, it's not there, right? Anyway, this case will haunt you for the next year, so trigger warnings abound. With that, I'm Courtney Fenner. And I'm Amanda Cronin. And a Nefarious Nightmare presents Seeing Red Fibers, the monster that is Bobby Joe Long. Before we begin, uh, I want to give a heads up. I'm battling what I believe is a bad sinus infection, so if I sound a bit like Darth Vader, sorry and shit, and if you don't know that song, it's by Tech 9 my favorite rapper, but that's besides the point. Also, we wanted to take a quick moment to thank everyone who's rated and reviewed us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, and even Good Pods. Without you, we wouldn't be where we are today. Yes, And by the way, if you haven't already and you love our show, please go give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings and reviews not only validate us because we work way harder on this podcast than you'd ever think, but it also lets us know and new listeners know that we're doing a pretty great job. All right, let's get to it. Robert Joseph Long was born on October 14th, 1953 in Canova, West Virginia. A fun fact, he's also a distant cousin of Henry Lee Lucas, which we find odd, but it's also interesting. But anyway, his mother, Luella, moved him to Miami as a young child. Luella was a cocktail waitress and wore scandalous outfits and would bring home strange men often, which Bobby Joe despised. He is another serial killer that had a very dysfunctional relationship with his mother, even sleeping with her until he was well into his teenage years. Also to note is that he killed his own dog as a child by shooting it in the vagina, which is horrific. Something you should know about Bobby Joe is that he was born with an extra X chromosome that made him grow breasts during puberty, which he was bullied about. He also had multiple head injuries, including being knocked unconscious for several minutes as a result from falling off a swing. He had been knocked unconscious for approximately 20 minutes from falling down some stairs. He had been hospitalized for a week from being hit by a car at age 7. Then he had a motorcycle accident at age 20 while enlisted in the army, which he suffered head injuries. As a result, he was discharged from the army, which we briefly mention in a bit. 
When he was in the hospital after the motorcycle crash, he began to have violent outbursts and became overly obsessed with sex, including masturbating up to five times a day while in a full body cast he had to wear. I don't think it's necessarily caused him to be a shitbag, but I'm guessing it didn't help his mental health, since it's pretty well known study that severe head injuries do tend to exacerbate serial killer behaviors. While this might be debatable, the statistics are pretty damning. In his teenage years, he had brushes with the law, which included stealing a car battery and resisting police. This all happened before being recruited to the army, which shortly after his recruitment in 1974, he married his high school sweetheart and childhood neighbor, Cynthia. Bobby Joe and Cynthia then had two children, but soon after, she filed for divorce in 1980 when she just couldn't take the violent outbursts anymore, and she left with her children. In fact, Cynthia reported that he once choked her until she was unconscious and then slammed her head into the television. Quote, When I came to, I was on the couch. Of course, he was there, crying. I'll never do it again. I'm so sorry. Then the next words were, when you drive yourself to get your stitches, if you tell them what really happened, I'll kill you when you get home, end quote. After Cynthia left him is when he became known as the classified ad rapist. He would look through the classified ads and go to the homes of people selling, ask to use their restrooms, and then he would rape the women if they were home alone by pulling a knife and tying them up. In the years between 1981 and 1984, he committed up to 50 rapes using this method. He did this in California, where he lived with Cynthia, and also in Florida, when he moved back after she divorced him. Even one time in 1981, he was charged, tried, and convicted of a rape, but he appealed it, and the conviction was then acquitted. In October of 1981, a woman named Sharon Richards was living with Bobby Joe when she accused him of rape. The police said they didn't have enough evidence, so they didn't bring any charges to him. Two weeks later, Bobby Joe hit Sharon during a fight. Finally, in 1983, he was found guilty on the assault. He was furious and wrote the judge a bunch of letters demanding a new trial. He told the judge that he didn't do anything and that Sharon was just lying about him. And in 1984, he was awarded a retrial and was acquitted despite the testimony of several witnesses against him. When he left the courtroom, he turned and laughed straight at Sharon. This just tells you what kind of sick monster this guy truly was. Adding to the fact that this man is truly horrific, in the middle of that whole Sharon Richards trial, Bobby Joe was busy finding a girlfriend, Emma, whom he worked with at the hospital where he was an x-ray technician, and she was a nurse at that same hospital. She thought he was so sweet since, you know, he would love bomb her by showering her with jewelry, but... Unbeknownst to her, they were all stolen items from his many rape victims. He even stooped so low that on November 18th, 1981, he sent a 12-year-old little girl nude pictures of himself. He was arrested at this time, jailed for two whole days, pleads no contest, and gets time served of six months and a fee of $66.50 in fines and court costs. This isn't only to show you how much of a monster he was, this is also a testament to the fact that our justice system typically is more in favor of the offender who usually gets off with a slap on the wrist while lesser offenders get 40 years for, I don't know, weed in some states. In those years, he worked as an x-ray technician in various places in California, West Virginia, and Florida, one time getting fired for asking women to undress for the x-rays. He was not only sick, but also really bold. That part is very obvious. He had some jobs at convenience stores and even at a funeral home. He had a few child support hearings for his two children, and one of them, he got really angry in the courtroom for being called a quote-unquote deadbeat dad multiple times. Talk about a narcissist. He can't take the heat, but he sure tries to run the kitchen. On April 4th, 1984, he abducted a woman from a shopping center after admiring her Jaguar car and talking her into giving him a test ride. He allegedly pulled a gun on her and in a panic, she wrecked her car in order to escape. Police never found the gun and Bobby Joe received three years of probation, which is ridiculous. 
He then moved to Tampa in 1984 when I guess he was getting to be too notorious. He was said to always drive up and down Tampa's Nebraska Avenue, which is where the clubs, bars, and sex workers were most often found. Around this time is when he escalated to murders. Artist Wick, more commonly known as Anne, was 20 years old. He abducted, raped, and strangled her on March 27, 1984, and was found nearly eight months later, November 22, 1984. Anne hitchhiked from Gas City, Indiana to Tampa. It's alleged that she was engaged to be married, so she had unfortunately left behind a fiancé at the hands of this monster. June Tai Lana Long, who was 19 years old, was found on May 13, 1984 in a field. She was nude and bound with a cord tied around her neck. Underneath her was a white scarf tied in a knot. Lena had just moved to Tampa that February and worked as a dancer at the Starlight Lounge and Sly Fox Lounge. She had told her old manager that she was trying to go back to school and she had hopes of studying art and cinema. She was known to have a huge heart. A friend of hers was quoted to say, quote, there's no reason why somebody that sweet should have to die. Michelle Sims, 22 years old, was a former beauty contestant and had been working as a receptionist and sometimes as a sex worker, was found two weeks after Lana in a similar way. She was nude and bound with her throat slit. Michelle's body was found more quickly than others, so they immediately sent the FBI lab the evidence collected. She was also the only murder victim to gain him a death sentence. The hairs from her body and clothing were brown, medium-length Caucasian hairs that could only have originated from the killer, so they knew they had something here. Elizabeth Ludenbach was discovered in an orange grove on June 24, 1984. She was a factory worker who had actually never been a sex worker, which didn't seem to fit this killer's M.O. The police think she just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. She was only a few blocks away from her home when she was taken. Elizabeth worked at an electronics factory and lived with her stepfather. She grew up in Lincoln City, Indiana and had only moved to Florida two years prior to her murder with her mother and younger brother and sister. Vicki Elliott disappeared on September 7, 1984 on her way home from her job at the Ramada Inn. She was strangled and found on November 16, 1984. Vicki had already purchased an airline ticket to return to Muskegon, Michigan, on October 5, 1984, where she planned to attend school and become a paramedic. She was the daughter of Laura Elliott. Vicky's mother and brothers and sister were at Bobby Joe's execution. One of Vicky's older brothers, Frank Jr., said, quote, I thought he took the coward's way out. He kept his eyes closed, so he didn't even have to look at us. End quote. Yeah, he's definitely a coward. I absolutely agree. But anyway, Vicky had moved to Florida after graduation with Frank Jr. because they had relatives there. Frank said, quote, We were young and looking for something different. He then said that he went to Florida first and she followed him out about six months later. They lived together for a while, but then moved to separate apartments. Frank also stated that, quote, We were young and had to take care of ourselves. We went to nightclubs and beaches, really just surviving. Frank ended up returning to Michigan, and just a few weeks later is when Vicky went missing. Her family knew something was wrong when they didn't hear from her. It wasn't like Vicky to miss work. They contacted the police and reported her missing when she didn't show up to work for a couple of days. Her mother, Laura, says that, quote, She was a good student and a good worker. She was very responsible and no one complained about her. She wrote and called regularly. We were very worried. After so long, you know something's wrong. Forensics ended up confirming that all the murders were connected due to tiny red nylon carpet fibers being on all the victim's clothing and that white scarf found with Lana. On October 7th, 18-year-old Chanel Williams' body was found. She was a sex worker and her murder was kind of different than all the others being that she was his only black victim and she had not been tied up and she died from a gunshot. She was nude when she was found with her clothes, except her bra, were laying all next to her and the tiny red carpet fibers were found on her clothes as well. Her bra had been tied in a knot and found hanging from an entrance gate. 
Chanel's mother, Lula, and her younger sister, Algalana, were both present at Bobby Joe's execution. During an interview, Lula stated, quote, I'm just waiting for that time, and I want to see the look on his face. I want to see the pain on his face. What he inflicted to my daughter and those other women, he didn't have any right to do that. Chanel is described as a loving soul with a great sense of humor. Chanel's sister said, quote, It's been horrible. I think about her a lot. And it's kind of hard when you know you can't see your sister again. You look at the pictures and you try to reminisce about the things that happened when you were growing up. It's just really hard knowing how she passed and it was nothing you can do about it. People may think I'm horrible for saying this, but I just hope it's painful and I hope you burn in hell, end quote. Lula also said that, quote, to lose a daughter, I can't begin to really explain how it feels. You know, it's a part of me that was taken away from me. Not just natural death causes, I could deal with that more so than having to deal with what happened to her by this person. I don't have any pity for him. No, nothing. Nothing. He's getting what he deserved. Karen friend's body was found October 1984 in an orange grove like Elizabeth Ludenbach. She was 28 years old and working as a sex worker. She was strangled and bludgeoned to death. She did have a daughter, Alexa, and was sadly in and out of jail a lot due to prostitution and drugs. Her stepsister, Cher Lothar, told a reporter that, quote, None of that negates the fact that she was a beautiful, bright little girl and she was loved by her family. Everything has the opportunity to turn their life around and my sister never got that chance, end quote. And honestly, especially now in 2022, any kind of sex work doesn't take away from the fact that these are human beings with entire lives and livelihoods. So once they found Karen, all homicide detectives were assigned to the case. Other cases were assigned to property detectives. Six tactical deputies were assigned to do night surveillance on the strip that, you know, he was picking up the ladies, which again was Nebraska Avenue and West Kennedy Boulevard in North Tampa. The patrol division were given alerts and were consistently sending in field interrogation reports, which were checked. A personal computer was purchased specifically for this investigation and was used to record information on vehicles, vehicle tags, information gathered from talking to sex workers, and information from the reports. It also was after Karen was found that they went public to warn the community and that they might have a serial killer in the area. Uh, we do want to mention that the red carpet fibers were kept confidential from the public. Kimberly Hobbs was found on October 31st, 1984, but her murder was not connected to Bobby for a while due to elements from being left on the side of a highway and not being able to identify her. The police said too much time had passed, so they couldn't really collect any forensic evidence. Very little is sadly known about Kimberly. She was known in and around the Tampa Greyhound track. One store clerk said that she would come in almost daily and buy Cokes and chips throughout the day. We also know that she had dreams of moving out west to Texas. On November 3rd, 1984, Lisa McVeigh, who was 17 years old at the time, was riding her bike home from working at Krispy Kreme at around 2 a.m. Bobby Joe ran at her, pushed her off her bike, dragged her into his car, blindfolded her, and drove her to his home and repeatedly raped her for 26 hours. Sadly, Lisa had planned to take her life just a few hours before Bobby Joe had actually abducted her. Her mother was a drug addict and after being in and out of foster care until she was 14 when she went to live with her grandmother. Her grandmother's boyfriend would hold a gun to her head as he molested her for three years which drove her to sit down that morning of November 3rd and write a suicide note. She is later quoted saying, quote, I was deathly afraid that he was going to kill me. Here I was thinking about killing myself and now I was going to be fighting for my life. Lisa tried to act like she was connecting with him, even after he raped her and sodomized her by once asking him why he did this. And he simply replied that it was because he hated women. Lisa said that once he took her into the bathroom and washed and brushed her hair, she would continue to talk with him about his problems with women and acted like she sympathized with him and even offered to be his girlfriend. Lisa even tried to identify and empathize with this killer by vulnerably telling him 
about how she was the sole caregiver for her ailing father. Of course, we found out later that this was actually all made up in an effort to hone in on his soft side and save herself, which is really smart if you think about it. When she was in his apartment, she remembers trying to touch things so her fingerprints would be there. She was blindfolded or told to keep her eyes shut during all of this. She was also able to drop a barrette next to his bed so that something of hers would be left behind. She later said that after raping her several times, he fell asleep and when he woke up, he just said that he trusted her now and he seemed more relaxed and he was more gentle with her. He started calling her babe instead of bitch and even told her at one point that he wished he could just keep her. Then, on November 4th, after he seemed like he wasn't interested in her anymore, Bobby Joe put Lisa into the back of his car. She remembers counting the steps from his house to the car and even noticed his red carpet out of the bottom of her blindfold. He drove to an ATM, which she could hear, and from the underside of her blindfold, she could see the word Magnum on the car dashboard. Only 1978 Dodge Magnums had this. He drove her a little bit more and then pulled over and told her to get out and keep the blindfold on. He simply said, take care, and he was gone. He let her go. So this right here is a testament to trauma and also survivor mode. When you're in an eat or be eaten state, sometimes your brain works not with you, but for you. I don't know if that makes any sense to you guys, but it absolutely does to me. You know, your memory increases. You're in such a state of shock that you're calm. It's like your adrenaline is rushing so hard that you just, you have to be calm. It's, it's weird. You're just, something takes over you, you know, and you're, again, your adrenaline can be so high that it's virtually undetectable. In that survivor state, you will literally do anything to survive. And the way she did it was meticulous and methodical. Essentially, this man fucked with the wrong one. And I mean, of course, none of the victims deserved any of this, but she was the last straw that broke the camel's back. One quote I saw from Lisa was, quote, I would say thank you for choosing me and not another 17-year-old girl. Another 17-year-old girl probably wouldn't have been able to handle it the way I have. I truly believe that all the abuse I had been through in my life helped me get out of that situation, end quote. As soon as he left, Lisa went straight to the police and told them everything she could remember including the color of his car, the word Magnum on the dashboard, the red carpet. She told them that he had used an ATM just before he let her go. Lisa's clothes were taken to forensics and the red fibers found on her clothes matched those of all the other victims. Lisa also reported the assault from her grandmother's boyfriend and ended up getting him convicted. After she aged out of the teen center she had lived in, she went to live with an aunt and uncle who were carrying people. In 1999, Lisa began working at the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office as a dispatcher and reserve deputy. She was deputized in 2004 and then worked in the department that tracked down and arrested Bobby Joe Long. Her specialty now is combating sex crimes and protecting children. She provides middle school students with education on how to handle dangerous situations. On November 6th, remains of Virginia Johnson were found. She was 18 years old and red carpet fibers were found at the scene, but sadly only her bones were left and a single ligature cord. Virginia was from originally Connecticut and had been in Florida off and on for about two years before her untimely death. She was often seen hanging out around the Sly Fox Lounge Virginia sadly lost a sister in a car accident a year prior to her murder. Then, on November 12th, police found 21-year-old Kim Swan. She was found with marks on her neck and wrists and, of course, the red carpet fibers that we keep mentioning. Kim had been a dancer who had just moved back in with her parents along with her one-year-old son, Robbie. She had enrolled in a vocational school program to become a medical technician. Each team of detectives were assigned certain areas to search. Lo and behold, one of those teams were driving around the area and noticed a red Dodge Magnum driving down Nebraska Avenue. The vehicle was stopped and the driver was told that they were looking for a robbery suspect. The driver identified himself as Robert Joe Long and was photographed and a field interrogation report was written. 
but they couldn't know for sure if this was their suspect. During the same time, another team was subpoenaing the records for all the bank machines in the North Tampa area, while another team was pulling together a list of all 1978 Dodge Magnum owners in Hillsborough County. They compared those two lists and only found one 1978 Dodge Magnum owner that had used an ATM at 3 a.m. on November 4th, Robert Joe Long. Police found Bobby Joe's car and home not far from the ATM only two hours after they had stopped him. They then began a 24-hour surveillance of his apartment. The task force then consulted with the Behavioral Science Unit at the FBI for guidelines to use when interviewing a suspect. A special agent from the FBI laboratory in Washington was flown to Tampa for an immediate comparison of fibers from the apartment and vehicle and to assist in the crime scene searches. An airplane was even standing by so that after they arrested him, that agent could be flown immediately to the closest FDLE lab, which had the special microscope required for comparison of the fibers. After everything was ready, the signal to arrest him was given. Bobby Joe was in a movie theater when they were ready, so when he walked out of his movie, they arrested him. He was then driven back to his apartment, where 10 to 15 detectives were waiting. In Hillsborough County, it is preferred to serve a search warrant while the owner of the property is there to witness it. And they were not taking any chances, so they did this by the book. But, just like the coward he is, he refused to get out of the police car to witness the search. Police say that during his interrogation, Bobby Joe first confessed to the kidnapping and rape of Lisa McVeigh, but denied anything else until the police told him all the evidence they had on him. He confessed pretty quickly, and by the time the police walked out of the room, he had confessed to 10 murders. The state also retained the option to seek the death penalty for the murder of Michelle Sims. In July of 1986, the penalty phase of the Michelle Sims trial was held in Tampa. It only lasted one week and received a huge volume of media attention. He was found guilty and was sentenced to die in Florida's electric chair. All the victims, all of them, you know, and you're talking about a lot of them, a lot. A lot of lives just gone right down the tubes because of me, you know, in one way or another. And it's not a good feeling. It's not a pleasant feeling. I'm not proud of anything I've done. And the worst thing is I don't understand why. I don't understand why. Even though he confessed to raping and killing women, his confession was thrown out and his trial went straight to the penalty phase. In early 1985, he received the death penalty after he was convicted and appealed his first-degree murder conviction and death sentence for crimes committed in Hillborough County. He then appealed to the first-degree murder conviction of Virginia Johnson on appeal from the circuit court in Pasco County. Bobby Joe's death sentence was vacated and his conviction reversed. His case remanded to the trial court with directions to enter an order of acquittal for the murder of Virginia. On February 24th, 1999, he accused the Capitol Collateral Regional Council, who are those to defend death row inmates and their appeals, of revealing his private letters to a book author. This is considered violating attorney-client privilege. He also accused the agency of running a quote-unquote death pool, betting on the date inmates would be executed on, and asked that the agency be removed from his case. An investigation into these allegations were unfounded, and Bobby Joe's petition for a writ of mandamus to require Bob Dillinger, the public defender, for the Sixth Judicial Circuit to relinquish possession and control of his file was denied. According to the Florida Department of Corrections, Bobby Joe had one five-year sentence, four 99-year sentences, 28 life sentences, and one death sentence to serve total. A plea bargain was agreed upon, which he pled guilty to eight out of the 10 murders. He acknowledged Artis and Vicky's murders, but since their bodies were not found until after his arrest, he was never technically charged for them. Bobby Joe received 28 life sentences for murder, rape, including the classified ad rapes and kidnapping. He also was sentenced to death for the murder of Michelle Sims. Here is a short clip to hear from Chanel's mother. He inflict pain on my daughter and the other victims. And he's worried about pain, what he's gonna feel. No, 
It's not right. Lulu Williams is the mother of a murdered daughter done at the hands of Bobby Joe Long, who was convicted and sentenced to death in 1984. He's admitted to killing nine women in Hillsborough and Pasco counties. It's just been too long. This is a strain. This is emotional physical on the family. The governor signed a death warrant for Long last week and his attorneys are trying to fight it, saying lethal injection is cruel and unusual punishment because of his medical condition. And to have this person find excuse after excuse to not to face his judgment, you know. This time he did that wrong, pay for it. You got to pay for your sins. An uncle of the victim, too emotional to be interviewed. Pain, just imagine my niece went through. Long. On May 23rd, 2019, after requesting roast beef, bacon, and chips, and being one of the longest serving inmates on death row, Bobby Joe Long was executed by lethal injection at 6.55 p.m. with Lisa McVeigh Noland watching from the front row. Quote, I wanted to look him in the eye. I wanted to be the first person he saw. Unfortunately, he didn't open his eyes. End quote. She is now a deputy at the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. Lisa McVeigh went on to say, quote, The peace that came over me is a remarkable feeling. End quote. Once Bobby Joe was dead, another family member of a victim wore a polo shirt with a photo of the victim on the front and the words, gone but not forgotten. And on the back were photos of all 10 victims and the words, the ones that matter. We really want to include the victim testimony and the thoughts from the victim's families after he was put to death since the victims and the families are the most important part of any of our stories. Are you available? Just right here. Okay. Put your sink you want to go sure. I'm going to make it real short. Um, I want to spend a special thank you out to Governor Ron DeSantis, Ashley Moody, and any other key player that made this day happen for all of us. It was a game changer. It was a beautiful day, and anybody that is in our shoes in the near future, please stay vigilant. Don't stop until you get it done. Thank you. Sir, your full name? Jeffrey Cinco. You Cinco? S-I-E-N-K-O. Jeffrey with a G or J? J. Thank you. E-R-Y or R-E-Y? R-E-Y. Your relationship? <clears throat> uh, Vicki Elliott was my sister. You need to go on. Knowing, like I say, justice have been served. Ma'am, would you have liked to have heard him give an apology or anything to, there's 26 of you in that room waiting to see this. Did you want to hear anything from him? I, I just. There's really nothing you can Nothing, say. nothing, nothing, nothing. No, I'm just, like it, if things went, that's, that was fine with us. It was fine. Tell us a little bit about your loved one. We, the victims always get lost in this. Can you just describe the life that was lost for, for all of the family members and how it's been for y'all? Yeah, go ahead. This is our sister. This is our sister. This is our Jelana. <coughs> my sister was a kind person. Um, she was my older sister. She was funny. Um, she would do anything to help someone she would do anything for anyone and for something like this to happen to her regardless of what she what choices she may have done in the past she did not deserve this none of these victims deserve this so that's what that's the hardest thing about this whole situation is what these victims went through the incident the execution was without a hitch do you wish that he'd suffered more yes if I could have had my way, he would have been yeah. executed for every person life he's took. It was too easy. He was too comfortable. You know, just think about what he put his family through, us, the other Sorry, family. Say that. Say that again. Put us through for all these years, you know, and to see him just just lay there and just at peace, you know, just comfort like nothing. No remorse, no anything. But it's gonna give us closure. 
I'm Tammy Caspi. Kim Swan is my sister. Um, I witnessed the execution as well. It looked like it went very peacefully for him, and it's finally over. I don't, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> what was it like being in a room with so many others who have gone through at least some of what you guys have gone through, all these other folks who have been here? Pretty emotional, you know, knowing what they're feeling firsthand. It's pretty hard. Can we describe your loss? Um, Kim was taken 30, five, four or five years ago. Describe your loss of not having her in your life. The loss to your parents who wanted to be here, who weren't able to be here. Right. Talk about that. My parents have both passed and were not able to be here. Um, I was very close with Kim. It's been a major loss having her gone and knowing that she's never going to be here. 35 years is a long time to wait. If he had been sentenced to life, perhaps you may have been able to start healing earlier, but maybe not have that closure. Which would have been better? The death sentence. Yeah. For Terry, me. I believe your sister was the last victim, is that correct? Yes. Can you take me through what was going on at the time in Tampa Bay? Were people fearful? Yeah. Was this something that women were... Yeah, the general public knew that there was a serial killer at large. And when we found out that my sister was missing, it was... <laughs> horrible you know and then finding out that she was a victim pretty devastating the death of our daughter nine months after my attack I've been blessed with a wonderful family and great friends I'd like to thank all of the law enforcement all of the detectives governor Ron DeSantis Today, justice was served. Thank you. Did this moment feel the way you thought it would feel? It was, there was really no describing how this moment would feel, to be honest. It's just surreal, but it closes another door for me. Are you one of the victims of the classified ad attack? Yes, I am, in Pinellas County. That's correct. How has, it, how has it affected your trust? Um, I mean, clearly, you were doing just something that, it, either trying to sell something and That's let correct. someone into your home. Has it, has it affected your trust as a stranger? It? <laughs> it has. Um, it took, took quite a while to uh, get beyond it, but I have. But I will always have that in my mind. And um, it's, it's just, it's difficult. It's been very difficult. What was it like to see him again, know you were in the same sort of space? Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was hard, but I, I, was, I was good with that. I was good that he's meeting his maker. It's hard to hear you say that you've lived a joyful life. Do you feel Thank you. that that joy in some way to do that, to represent some of the women who didn't have a chance to do that? Uh, yes, and absolutely, absolutely. I would love to, to represent those and those victims that did not survive, because I know how lucky I was. I'm very thankful, and this is, uh, like Linda said, a 35-year, I won't call it an anniversary, because that's too pleasant behind that. She and I will also have our 45-year wedding anniversary in about four weeks. So we've both endured. She's been the rock. She's strong. She's the strong one in our family. But I had a few things just jotted down, just brief thoughts. For me, there's always people will ask about closure. To me, this is for myself, uh, as a family victim, the closure isn't really here for me. My closure came, our event happened in May of 84. As you know, he wasn't caught until November. Those were the longest 
count them, I don't know, six months of our lives. We moved out of our home. We moved four or five times. There was just so much. But I was going to say November 16th of 84, that's the day that everybody remembers, the victims of Bobby Joe Long. That day of his arrest, then no one else we knew, I knew right then, he would never be released and there would be no more victims by him. And that's the day that helped start my self-healing. Um, and thanks to Lisa and her ta tactical force and her help, that was the best that anybody could wish for because if you could imagine if he just left the state and kept going to live like that, we just, you couldn't even, I think we probably may not have survived unless he was captured. My name is Susan Smith and I've been asked to uh, read a statement from the family of Karen Densfriend, D-I-N-S-F-R-I-E-N-D. -E the life of Karen Densfriend was cut short, no matter what kind of life it was. Her choice to finish her life and make new decisions was halted because of someone else who was selfish and foolish, sick and wrong. One life will never make up for another and will never be an equalizer. If conversations about mental health and getting help happened 30 years ago, we might be in a different place. We wouldn't be reading statements about death and dying and hurt and anger, and for some, hopefully forgiveness. We wouldn't be wondering what life would be like before it all happened. It does not soothe my soul to know that he was executed. He will now be at peace for knowing the kind of monster he is. Hopefully this will help, help some sleep well and feel a sense of justice and closure. It does, however, put an end to a chapter of this story. For us and our family, we can close the book and try to heal and learn from the past. Good evening. Wow, bright light. I'm Lisa McVeigh Nolan. Um, I have a victim statement to write, or to read, I'm sorry. A little nervous, I'm not used to being in front of all these cameras all at one time. Um, it's a little lengthy, so bear with me. Um, I just wanna give credit to God, first and foremost, who saved my life 35 years ago. Um, I'm gonna dedicate and uh, in honor and memory of the victims, our 10 angels who can't be here today to witness the execution of Bobby Geelong. So in honor, in memory and honor of the victims, Artis Wick, Lana Long, Michelle Denise Sims, Chanel Williams, Elizabeth Loudenback, Karen Disfriend, Vicki Elliott, Kimberly Hops, Virginia Johnson, and Kimberly Swan. I'd like to take a moment to remember and honor the victims who never got the chance to be here today to witness the execution of Bobby Geelong. I'd also like to take a moment to remember the victims who were viciously attacked in their own homes at the hands of Bobby Geelong. In the early hours of November 3, 1984, I was snatched off my bicycle and brutally attacked by Bobby Geelong while riding home from work. Bobby Geelong pressed a gun with the tip of its cold steel barrel against my left temple before dragging me to his car. I vowed from that moment on to save my own life. Bobby Geelong kidnapped me and held me hostage for the next 26 hours. I was brutally raped and tortured. I believed him, he told me he would kill me if I tried to ever escape. I didn't think I would live or ever see my family again. However, the early hours of November 4th, 1984, Bobby Geelong released me. I promised, my, promised myself I would never live as a victim. I would empower myself with strength and courage to conquer my life's tragedies. Sorry. I made a lifetime commitment to educate people by speaking about how I survived my attack from a notorious serial killer and the abuse I endured as a child. I asked surveyed it myself a long time ago to make it my obligation to be the voices of the women's lives he took too soon. Today, as I stand before God, the victims, and the families of the victims, I vow to carry on and be their voice. Again, I ask everyone, please, please remember the victims who were taken too soon. Each and every victim's name will, for, will be forever embossed in my heart. Each and every, excuse me, I will never forget any of them. Even though I didn't know these women, we had one common denominator, and that was you, Bobby Geelong. Bobby Geelong, people ask me, 
what I would say to you if you were standing in front of me. And here's my answer. Bobby DeLong, thank you. Thank you for choosing me instead of another 17-year-old little girl. The reason why I say thank you now is because I have forgiven you for what you have done to me. Had I not forgiven you, I might as well be in my own prison without walls. God has shown me the only way to really be free when someone bestows, bestows injustice against you is complete forgiveness. I was still a human being and I want him to show, show him that, that I was still a very compassionate human being. you feel like that same feeling? Absolutely. Yes, I do. Did you stop by your tree on the way there? Um, funny you ask. No. However, I did stop in my tree last week and took some pictures. Um, and I also might sound a little wacky, I don't know, but I, I, I hugged my tree. And I thank God that I'm able to stand there and hug my tree. I know, I'm a tree hugger, I guess you could say, so, technically. So, but it makes me feel, when I'm having a bad day, I, sometimes I just go off to my tree and I'll, I'll sit under the tree for a while and just, just think and just pray. And that was the very first thing after my release, is what I saw when I pulled my blindfold down, was this beautiful oak tree. And it just meant that oak tree means so much to me. I mean, eventually I like to get a marker put there with the victims' names on it and, and, and make sure we can dedicate that tree to the families and the, families, the victims of the family. There is so much more to these victim testimonies, and we will include that entire clip, the link to that in our show notes. But we wish the families of these victims well, and we do hope that they feel some sense of closure. To these victims, may they rest in peace. Don't forget, go rate us on Apple if you love us. If you hate us, that's fine, but please email us instead of rating us. We want to know what we can do better. Also, this week, we will be at the Dallas True Crime Podcast Festival. This week, y'all. It's been a long time coming, and I'm fucking nervous. Courtney, don't be nervous. We got this. Yeah, but I don't people well. Social anxiety like a mug. Green room, girl. Green room. Go in there. Decompress. All will be fine. (laughs) I mean, I'll try. Man, I'll try. I'll try. But anyway, these victims that we discussed today, they are some of the most vulnerable. Sex workers, women, people of color, they tend to be the most vulnerable and often are the most overlooked in the justice system. But they are bees. They absolutely are bees. And when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. Original intro music by Ghost Stories Incorporated. Remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional music provided by Epidemic Sound. This podcast was researched, scripted, and produced by Amanda Cronin and Courtney Finner. A Nefarious Nightmare is a Cloud 10 I Heart podcast. Managed by a Nefarious Nightmare, Sim Sarna, and Jamie Rice of Murderish and Dirty Money Moves. Thank you again for listening, and be vigilant.